Hello, everyone. Welcome to the seventh Asia Pacific Climate Change Adaptation Forum. My name is Hermes, and I will be your technical facilitator today to ensure that you have a smooth experience with Zoom. You are at the session titled Welcome and Highlights from Day 4, which will be immediately followed by the plenary session on finance and investment. Japanese language interpretation is available during the session. The feature has already been activated and is available now. To listen in Japanese, please click the interpretation button in the menu at the bottom of your screen and select Japanese. We will begin in just a moment here, but before we get started, we would like to let you know that this meeting will be recorded for documentation purposes. The chat box is available in case you have any perspective you'd like to share or if you need to reach out to me for technical assistance. For those of you just joining us, welcome. You are the session titled Welcome and Highlights from Day 4, which will be followed immediately by the plenary panel on finance and investment. I think that we are now ready to get started, so I will pass the floor to Mozaharu Alam, head of the APAN Secretariat and Regional Climate Change Coordinator at the United Nations Environment Program, Asia and the Pacific Office. Mozaharu, the floor is yours. Thank you, Harmas. Dear participants, good day. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to the fifth day of the seventh Asia Pacific Adaptation Forum. Hope you had a good rest. And I also hope many of you have attended the special event organized yesterday. It's also my pleasure to welcome you to this session on highlights of day four. Highlights of day four will be presented by Desire of Tofu Creative. She will take us through her artwork covering the plenary session on technologies and practices, as well as the four technical sessions organized by our partners, Asian Development Bank, the Stockholm Environment Institute, ECMOD, UNDP, UNEP and IUCN. So with that, I'd like to hand over to Desire to take us through her artwork uh, and sharing the key messages of day four. Over to you, Desire. Thank you, Babu. Welcome everyone to our last day. I am Desire from Tofu Creatives. And in case you missed it, we captured yesterday's events through these live illustrations. So while the events were happening, we were listening and drawing your insights. Um, I would like to give a shout out to my teammates, Nitya, Kiko, Stephanie, and we're scribing from Manila, Zamboanga, California, and Belfast, covering more than 30 events for the whole week. Um, you can access these visuals through Miro. We'll be sending the link through the chat after this. And this was also shared on the Who Below feed. And the visuals from day one to three are complete and you can uh, check it in your own time. We update this as you go along. Whew, this has been a journey for all of us and I'll be walking you through this visual journey that we prepared. So let's begin. Starting with the plenary messages of technology and practices, Ashok started by saying that we must see the value of nature and nurture all types of capital. He also mentioned three ways to decouple growth in nature, which is resource productivity through technology, resource reduction through substitution, resource conservation through behavior change. Ashok cited numerous examples of how this is happening, and he mentioned that the disruptive technologies of the future will be industries based on biology. And as for our panelists, we heard messages on how the solutions are really rooted in climate justice. And for technology to scale, it must be durable, affordable, and simple. And we must have a user-centric approach and this has been a message all throughout the conference. Okay, moving on to inclusive resilience. Uh, the IR session centered on scaling up women's access and there was this strong quote on how women are not victims, they are change makers. And we must be able to provide women 
representation and access to decision making on all levels. There was also this beautiful sharing on how um, storytelling can generate empathy and we must destroy the illusion that gender-based discrimination is a thing of the past. And then other panelists uh, supported messages on how institutions need to support the resilience of women. And this includes having an enabling environment to thrive and building a paradigm where women can really take the lead. And then for the next session on nature-based resilience, there's a lot of growing attention on nature-based solutions, especially in the post-COVID era, where um, the integration of biodiversity is considered very much. And there's a growing understanding that economy and well-being depend on biodiversity. And from our panelists, we heard lessons from the region, barriers and opportunities. And the key messages include how we must take this opportunity for innovation on nature-based solutions to be part of COVID recovery. And we must be able to provide relevant information to stakeholders, really tailored messages that are important for them to know. And we must have faith in rural capacities, technologies, and innovations. Um, we need to see nature as an asset and not as a barrier to economic development. And finally, for this session, a speaker reminded us of Gandhi's message and how nature has enough for everyone's need, but not enough for everyone's greed. Okay, moving on to the economic sector resilience. There were two main categories on the messages. One is on the principles. And under that, messages include having a combination of high technology and local technology, high tech and low tech, that meets the user's needs. Second is to strengthen partnerships that can co-develop uh, solutions. And third, ensure benefits of technology is reaching the most vulnerable, of course. And then on actions for scaling up, we need to engage all, vector, all actors in the value chain, especially the private sector. Uh, we need to develop incentives and build capacity. We need to promote learning as practitioners can play a critical role in scaling out uh, successful practices. And as for communities and local resilience, we are recognizing the increasing vulnerabilities of communities. And there is a strong message as well on how interventions should address root causes. And it must definitely be built on the understanding of local conditions, as well as ensuring that access to these resources remain with the communities. And finally, there was this strong call for local inclusiveness in mediating and championing solutions. And that shared governance is pivotal in building sustained resilience. So just to go back a bit on some messages from the plenary that was a common theme in all streams throughout the day, moving from efficiency to sufficiency considering the inclusiveness of technology, not only for the current generation, but also for the future generation. And this was a strong message that was mentioned all throughout, which was how we definitely need to involve stakeholders in the development and deployment of technologies and innovation. So we are looking forward to capturing today's events on finance and investment. We hope that these visuals facilitated in the understanding of resilience beyond this conference. And it is our final day for APAN 2020, but we know that the work towards building a resilient world goes very much beyond this conference. Thank you, everyone, and we hope to continue drawing the big picture with all of you. Over to you, Babu. 
Thank you. Thank you, Desire, for presenting um, excellent messages through excellent uh, artwork. This is very impressive and, and very succinct as well. And, and thank you very much for highlighting that um, the technologies and practices need to be uh, people-centric, uh, need to engage uh, all the stakeholders, focusing on not only the current, uh, the generation and the vulnerable communities, but also the future generation and, and the development is, is primarily uh, need to focus the future development and the future generation too. Thank you also for highlighting that uh, nature provides uh, the solution and it is not a barrier to the economic development. Um, and, and, and so with that, um, as you mentioned that our uh, discussion today will focus on uh, finance and investment, which is an important uh, enabling factors for addressing climate change, uh, both in, in mitigation as well as adaptation and building the resilience. So we'll be focusing on, on the climate finance and investment. And one of the, the issues that we'll be focusing also today, not only the finance uh, coming through the the vertical fund, the fund established under uh, the Climate Change Convention, but also how the finance is happening through the private sector, how the finance is happening um, at the national level through the national budgeting and the planning system. So we'll be focusing on the finance and investment. Uh, it requires the participation, almost all financing institution to support the activities uh, and advancing the climate change adaptation action and, and building resilience. So our focus will be on, on that critical enabling factors. And as Desire, you mentioned that we are also looking forward uh, for excellent uh, capturing the discussion and the key messages through the artwork. Uh, we'll be missing that presenting um, today. <laughs> Uh, but I'm sure that we'll be able to share the excellent work that you and your team uh, is, is doing and supporting this uh, adaptation forum. Uh, we'll be able to share through our online platform, the conference platform that we are using, the Hubilo, the Asia Pacific Adaptation Forum website too. So with that, um, I'd like to now introduce uh, our moderator today for the first plenary session on the finance and investment. Um, Rico Hazen <clears throat> is our moderator uh, for the first the, the plenary session of the fifth day, which is the last day of the Open Forum. Um, so, so I'd like to hand it over to Rico, but before that, uh, I'd like to also mention the Rico Hazen is a multi-awarded broadcast journalist. Uh, he's currently uh, working as a senior anchor and director for news content development at CNN Philippines. Uh, he is the award-winning news anchor of the CNN mm -hmm. Philippines evening primetime general news program called The Final Word. With that, um, I'd like to hand over to Rico. Rico, over to you. Babu, thank you so much for that uh, wonderful uh, introduction, and it's uh, great to be back here. And to Desiree and to Babu, uh, thank you so much for those uh, uh, messages that you just delivered, uh, Desiree, for the visual journey. Uh, my goodness, I, I really love the visual, uh, the visuals and the, the artworks that you presented throughout the week. It gives us basically um, uh, inputs into how we can all relate. Uh, to the developments of climate change adaptation and mitigation. And of course, Babu, you mentioned that uh, we, we can't only act today, but we have to act today because we have to work for the future generations. Thank you so much for uh, uh, joining us today. Good morning, Asia. Uh, hello, world. Just like uh, whatever I say in my previous uh, news organization before I joined CNN Philippines. And wherever you are uh, joining us from 
uh, different time zones around the world. I would like to introduce myself. I am Rico Gizon, your host and moderator for day five. Well, we have reached day five. I was part of day one, uh, day two, and now day five. We are in the home stretch. We are about to cross the finish line, uh, ladies and gentlemen, for the seventh Asia Pacific Climate Change Adaptation Forum in this new normal uh, meeting and interacting with all of you virtually. I hope I can reach out to you, shake your hand, uh, maybe have a fist bump or maybe have a, uh, an elbow bump. That is what I want to do. I don't want to be online all the time. I really want to interact with all of you. I would like to thank the organizers for, for inviting me once again to be part of this important endeavor, moderating this very key uh, plenary session on finance and investment. And it would really be uh, wonderful to see hundreds of delegates uh, online right now. Uh, I really wish we were all together in uh, one city, one venue, just like the previous forums, interacting personally with each other, exchanging uh, notes, you know, um, exchanging uh, uh, business cards, ideas, and you know what, even emails and mobile numbers. Now we are connected via Zoom but not this time. And you know what, uh, Babu and all our panelists, I'm sure um, one of these days, hopefully in the eighth edition of APAN, we will all be together again. And this will just be an afterthought, all uh, meeting and talking and, and analyzing issues uh, online. But you know what, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, delegates who are watching us right now, this year long uh, uh, COVID-19 pandemic has, uh, really uh, taken a uh, terrible toll on economies and the well-being of people around the world. But it's certainly uh, not the only threat that humanity uh, faces throughout the week. We have been discussing this with so much attention and energy being devoted to the pandemic. Many people have taken you know, their eye off of the longer term threat posed by the climate change crisis, the climate change emergency. But with this forum, nothing will stop us from pursuing our objectives and goals to fight climate change. And together, as one in this forum, we will all unite. Even though we're not together, we are together online to find more solutions and answers to finance and invest in climate change adaptation and mitigation. To kick off uh, day five of our plenary, we have this a very important keynote speech from no less than the director of the International Center for Climate Change and Development at Independent University, Bangladesh. Ladies and gentlemen, delegates who are joining us for this day five of our plenary, let us all please welcome and listen in to this keynote speech of Salim Kok. Salim, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Rico, and thank you, Babu, uh, for uh, inviting me to this uh, exciting uh, final uh, plenary session of the final day of the 7th APAN Forum. Uh, it's been my pleasure to have been in the APAN Forums uh, all along, uh, uh, virtually now this time, but hopefully, as Rico says, the next time we will be able to meet again as we have done in the past face-to-face. Uh, -face. Uh, so I am going to give you a very personal take on where I th see uh, the issue of climate finance and adaptation finance and investment uh, taking place globally and also in our region in Asia Pacific. And I'll, I'll describe it in several phases of the way I, I see the evolution of this. The first phase was around um, the beginning of the, the century, around the early 2000s, when Adaptation was initially came to the fore. We, those of us who were working in adaptation at that time, we had to struggle to get people to understand adaptation, to recognize adaptation. Mm -hmm. It was all about mitigation. Not that we are against mitigation, but we said mitigation is not going to be enough. We're going to have to adapt as well. And it took us quite a few years to get that um, uh, to be recognized, to be um, you know, have decisions in the Conference of Parties, for example, uh, to set up funding for adaptation, to carry out national adaptation programs of action. Uh, and then these evolved into national adaptation plans. And gradually, 
financing for adaptation started to take place. A number of funds were created under the UN Framework Convention. And then we also had the global, uh, the Green Climate Fund uh, set up uh, more recently uh, with a significant uh, um, uh, uh, allocation for adaptation. So uh, that's the good news. Adaptation was recognized, adaptation funding started to flow, uh, not in huge amounts, uh, but it started to flow and it became a learning by doing exercise. Now, I think we are at the cusp of uh, making a shift from that early stage that we went through for let's say the last decade or so. And there are three main elements to this that I want to emphasize. The first one is to recognize that even though uh, funding for adaptation or finance for adaptation in the, within the uh, global finance for tackling climate change was recognized, it wasn't recognized enough. So whereas the uh, developing countries, particularly the vulnerable countries had demanded at least 50% of global funds should go for adaptation. In fact, only 20% has gone to adaptation so far. And that is not really acceptable. And, and it's recognized it's not acceptable. People are trying to correct it. They, the good news on the Green Climate Fund is that they have decided to do 50-50, which is good news. Um, so we are moving in the right direction, but we're not moving fast enough. The second uh, element of that uh, experience that we've had with the funding uh, of adaptation through the climate finance is that even though the amounts for adaptation have been relatively low, they have been significant. Uh, but within that, the amounts or the proportion of the funds that reached the most vulnerable communities in the most vulnerable countries was absolutely abysmal. It was only 10% of the 20% that went to adaptation. So only 2% of global uh, funding for climate change, tackling climate change, went to the most vulnerable uh, uh, communities in the most vulnerable countries. And in my view, that was absolutely uh, uh, unacceptable uh, because these global funds for adaptation should have been prioritized to the most vulnerable communities in the most vulnerable countries, and they weren't. We, we all, this is a collective failure from all of us. We were not able to deliver that. The good news is we recognize it now. We now know that. We know that we, we didn't do a good job. We have to improve what we, what we did and we will do that. And I'm very glad to see all the major uh, funding agencies, including several of the panelists represented here on GCF and uh, Asian Development Bank. The, we are all now rectifying this. The issue of uh, uh, supporting locally led adaptation has been adopted uh, at the Global Adaptation Summit, which took place last January. Many, many agencies have uh, come on board and they are now improving their delivery of climate finance that they have uh, under their uh, um, aegis to go to the most vulnerable communities in the most vulnerable countries. And that is the good news. But the bad news is not happening fast enough. Climate change is happening much faster than the money is reaching the people who need to get it. So we need to get our act together. We need to get much, much better. We need to be more faster. We need to be more effective. We need to be able to reach where it needs to reach. And we need to be supporting them. And, and just reflecting on the excellent uh, visuals artwork that we had a few minutes ago, that's the message coming through from all the sessions uh, yesterday is, we need to work with the most vulnerable communities, give them a say, give them opportunities and not tell them what to do and not neglect them. And so I think that message is, is a very big message that has come out uh, not only uh, from all the other sources, but from the APAN five days of meetings as well. The second issue that I would now segue to uh, is the realization, and this is where the COVID-19 pandemic uh, causes the whole system to shake up. The pandemic has uh, revealed the flaws in our global system and the lack of resilience in the global systems. And we realized that, you know, the way we were doing things was not right. It wasn't good enough. It wasn't resilient. And that if we want to come out of this pandemic and we want to face climate change as an even bigger emergency coming forward, we are going to have to change the way we do things. Business as usual isn't going to work anymore. So we have to come out on the other end with the COVID recovery plans as greener, better, more equitable, all kinds of things. The good news is everybody recognizes this. Every leader now will say that. 
The question is, how do we make them do it? Saying and doing are two different things, and we need to now segue from acceptance and saying things, from talking the talk to walking the walk, as they say, and make us actually make the kinds of investments that are required for us to build our resilience going forward, and in our context, help adapt to the impacts of climate change. And I will say that this opportunity is where we now have to segue from climate finance as something that is separate, like the adaptation fund or the uh, various other funds that we have, uh, which may be in the billions, but they're simply inadequate to, uh, up to the challenge, to getting into the mainstream of finance, not climate finance, but finance, investments, private sector, public sector, finance now has to be taking climate change on board and adaptation on board. Now, again, the good news is that this is being realized. More and more uh, uh, finance ministers and finance uh, executives and public, uh, private companies are taking climate into account, but they tend to take the mitigation side. So when we talk about green recovery and green plans, the focus is very much on mitigation. I'm not against that. That's a good thing. But we have not been able to convince them that adaptation is equally uh, requiring of their attention and building resilience is also a good investment. And there are lots of things happening there, but we are still not being able to get the bulk of the mainstream funding uh, that is coming uh, into uh, adaptation and resilience building. So I'll, I'll end my um, intervention with a couple of examples from my country, Bangladesh. In Bangladesh, we have been taking climate change more seriously, I argue, than any other country in the world. For the last more than 10 years, uh, we have taken climate change seriously. We have our own climate change strategy and action plan. Uh, we set up, uh, our government set up a, a, a fund, Bangladesh Climate Change Trust Fund. Our finance minister has been putting $100 million of our own money into this trust fund, which has been funding hundreds of projects on adaptation uh, all over the country, uh, particularly on locally led adaptation and community-based adaptation. And we've been going up a learning curve very, very steeply in terms of learning how to do adaptation at scale, not just in lots, uh, a few small projects, but at scale, countrywide scale for 160 million people. Now, in the last few years, we have made a big paradigm shift. And I'm going to argue that this paradigm shift is what we need everywhere. Every country in Asia needs to do this, which is that instead of having a separate fund for climate change, we need to have climate change built into the national budget. And the Bangladesh national budget in the last three years has been started to do that. We started with a handful of ministries. And now the third year we've done that, we have 25 ministries who each have a climate budget and each have things that they have put into their own budgets in their own activities to make them adaptive and resilient to climate change. And when we put that all together into a climate budget, we have a, a section of the national budget called the climate budget. It's 8% of the national budget, which is a very significant amount of money. And it's our money. It's not global money. It's not GCF money. It's not uh, Asian Development Bank money. It's our national exchequer. And that is an example of how seriously the country takes this issue how seriously the leadership of the country takes this issue, and most importantly, how seriously the finance minister takes the issue and is willing to put the resources that are needed uh, to tackle climate change as a high level uh, priority, not just a separate thing that we have to do on the side anymore. We are now integrating climate change into everything we do. And this is for everybody in the country. And, <laughs> and in that sense, Bangladesh, I would say, is a world leader on taking climate change and adaptation in particular very seriously. So let me end by making one pitch and I invite our artists to uh, pick this up, I hope, in, in, uh, when they rep uh, uh, report on, on uh, our session today, which is a pitch to the finance ministers of the Asia Pacific countries. In terms of investment, I'm going to shift from finance to investment. In my view, the best investment in terms of a return to make a country more resilient to climate change over five to 10 years, not immediately, but over five to 10 years, is to allocate at least 1% of your national budget in promoting national level research and knowledge generation on how to tackle climate change. 
Adaptation to climate change is still a learning by doing process. We don't have all the answers. We are doing lots of things. We are learning as we go along. There's still a lot of learning to be done over the next five years. If we invest in our own learning at the country level, in our own country, we don't depend on external consultants being flown in by uh, international agencies, which is how they do uh, learning and consultancy work. We, we build capacity at the national level to do research, to do it to meet the demands of our own country, to build our own capacity to adapt, to become more resilient. Over five years, that investment will give us dividends over the next five years, the second five-year period, that will take us to become a resilient country over 10 years' time. It, it's a slow process, but it is the best value for money. Only 1% of the national budget will give us a dividend that will make the country more resilient than all the money that we might be able to get from the likes of the GCF or the Asian Development Bank or other external uh, sources. Not that we don't want those, but we need to reflect on what is transformative about making ourselves more adaptive and resilient. And to me, it is about taking this as a national uh, um, you know, a, a task, a national endeavor, uh, and over the next five to 10 years, uh, making ourselves adaptive and resilient at the same time. And I think all the countries in Asia have the ability to do that, learn from each other, share for what we're doing with each other. In, in fora like this in the Asia Pacific region, uh, we are, in my view, way ahead of many of the other regions of the world. Uh, the Asia Pacific region has been talking and doing things uh, much more than the others. But now we need to have a step change in terms of uh, scaling it up by orders of magnitude, not just incremental scaling up, but orders of magnitude. And we need to think of ways to do that. I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Rico. Thank you so much, uh, Salim Hook, uh, for your uh, very uh, thorough and thought-provoking uh, solutions-based keynote speech. And of course, questions posed for governments around Asia Pacific and the finance ministers and for our panelists to think about. Let's now all watch this artistic video uh, performance by an international uh, cultural organization committed to raising awareness on social and environmental issues through artistic and educational programs. Let us all enjoy this performance by Grupo Jobel. Thank you so much. 
thank you so much uh, to Grupo Jobel for this beautiful artistic performance. Dance is indeed an important form of communication and music touches the soul in ways words cannot. All right, let's now uh, uh, proceed with our plenary on finance and investment. Uh, Salim Hook has really introduced to all of us the importance of uh, this session. So uh, let's now introduce our distinguished uh, panelists. First of all, we have the Associate Director of the Climate Policy Initiative Indonesia, Tiza Mafira. We have the Director of External Affairs from the Green Climate Fund, Oyun Sanjasuren. Thank you so much for joining us, Tiza and Oyun. And we have the Chief of the Climate Change and Disaster Risk Management Thematic Group, concurrently Director of the SDCD, and from the Asian Development Bank, Priti Ban Bandarj. And of course, Executive Director of the uh, Senior, uh, Executive Director, Senior Research Fellow for Sustainable Development Policy Institute. Let us all please welcome Abid Kayum Suleri. Thank you so much uh, for joining us. Uh, for this uh, fifth plenary session and focusing on finance and investment. Oyun, uh, let me start off with you because you were mentioned in the speech by uh, Salim and he mentioned, of course, that we are making progress in terms of adaptation funding, but uh, we are uh, not, 20% uh, of funding is unacceptable. Uh, we are moving forward, but not enough. Um, basically for the past year, uh, has the COVID-19 response affected adaptation, finance, and investment? Thank you so much, and uh, very happy to be on this panel. Mm -hmm. Your question, uh, from the GCF perspective, no. We ramped up mm -hmm. our delivery, the mandate, and then we actually increased the, um, what we've been allocating to developing countries on climate finance. When it comes to adaptation versus mitigation, Professor Salim Haq very rightly said so from the very beginning of the establishment of GCF in our governing instrument, it was very clear, GCF has to deliver 50-50 on adaptation and mitigation. So I yes. think the important point there is that it has to be part of the you know, underlying principles of many uh, organizations, but also going forward as well. So having said that, if we look at the pipeline coming, it's, uh, and I'll come back to that later, it's still very challenging to keep this 50-50 balance. And then I'm, I'm sure we'll get back to that sort of issue, but we've been keep, keeping this 50-50 and especially also another point on vulnerable countries, right? So again, in our governing, the initial document, it says, okay, once you allocate, even for the adaptation, portfolio, you have to allocate minimum 50% flow to SIDS, Africa, LDCs, vulnerable countries. So we've been, we've been achieving that as well. But the challenges are there. Mm -hmm. So why is it difficult for you to keep that balance of 50-50? It is difficult because, um, you know, and I think also Professor Huck mentioned as well, the, the mitigation projects, especially if you look at the history and then um, the private sector investment in mitigation is growing. Also, it's much less, well, by now, I think we are much readier to scale up mitigation projects. Very simple example being renewable energy, right? But for adaptation, on the other hand, it's very highly context specific, country specific. Also the planning stages for adaptation, the countries are very early stage on the adaptation planning. So for, for decision makers, it's quite, it's quite you know, easier or simpler to understand, okay, I invest into renewable energy, private sector invest, I'll, I'll risk a few things with GCF, but then for adaptation, the scales of projects are smaller to, to start with coming in as a pipeline. Then of course, you can't just have across many countries sort of, you know, just put a energy efficient uh, power line, right? It's very country specific, mm -hmm. it's smallholder farmers, it's how do you, it's all the, details of the projects. And then so if you look at the number of projects that come to GCF, the number of projects on adaptation is relatively high, which is good, but the volume is not as big as mitigation projects. Same with private sector. We have a lot of private sector coming in and then we work with uh, you know, accredited entities, entities like ADB 
and sort of with our partner uh, accredited entities, but then private sector comes in mostly on mitigation. Very few, few private sector would come on adaptation because they would not see at this stage too much sort of profits. And then there's still a lot of risk. It's still sort of small scale. Over to you back. So moving on now, thank you. Thank you so much, Oyun. Uh, you mentioned about the Asian Development Bank and uh, Priti, how is uh, uh, the ADB? Uh, supporting a uh, scaling up of adaptation finance in, in vulnerable countries. Uh, thank you, Rico, and thanks to the organizers for inviting ADB to this very important panel. In terms of scaling up adaptation um, activities and finance, I think, uh, uh, you know, apart from, as Oyun said, focusing on the financing uh, volume, what we need to look at is how we are building upfront technical assistance um, for receiving this financing. So to that extent, how are we supporting uh, the planning processes in our countries, the institutional strengthening and adaptation planning as uh, Salim also mentioned, because that would create the demand for financing as well, both domestic and internationally from funds such as GCF or uh, international institutions like us, uh, the ADB. So I'll just give you an example. Um, in the Pacific, for instance, we are enabling the countries to develop adaptation pathways for identifying adaptation investments. So that kind of upfront capacity in the countries to recognize the risks of climate, to do risk-informed planning, and then identifying adaptation investments is important. So, so that's an important shift, I would say, in how ADB is moving uh, on the adaptation front from not only climate proofing the investments we are making, but also creating this larger uh, systemic change in our countries for recognizing the risk and doing risk-informed planning. And of course, we have various internal funds uh, to enable that kind of an exercise and we've embarked on mm -hmm. it. Uh, the second important uh, area is uh, grant financing for adaptation. This has been a moot point in the climate negotiations as well. To what extent can we make available concessional financing and grant financing for adaptation? Again, at ADP, uh, you know, through our Asian Development Fund, uh, which is the equivalent of World Bank's IDA, International Development Assistance, we have now set up a separate thematic window for undertaking such investment projects with grants on, um, on adaptation and, you know, ensuring uh, that, that we, the primary purpose of these investments is adaptation and disaster resilience, uh, rather than an add-on of the investments that we make and then we try and make them climate proof. So we've set aside a large chunk of money from our Asian Development Fund, again, to make the step change that uh, uh, Salim was talking about. And uh, again, uh, the third important- But, but, but pretty, pretty. Pretty, I'd like to jump in here. I, I, you, you've set aside uh, funding, but uh, of course, the Asian Development Bank has also assisted uh, many uh, vulnerable countries, uh, particularly with their COVID-19 uh, responses. Has this, uh, in it, one way or another, uh, affected uh, uh, you know, climate change, uh, adaptation, finance, and investment? Well, if I look at the numbers only, I can tell you that you know um, over the last five years we've done about one billion in climate finance, uh, climate adaptation financing. So about five billion in the last five years, and we were expecting it to fall considerably in 2020 because the initial support was you know uh, the response to the pandemic in terms of PPEs and immediate health response. So from that perspective, we were expecting that uh, the adaptation financing will go down uh, significantly. Uh, the good news is on the adaptation side, it has not gone down uh, significantly. From 1 billion, we've come to around 800 million. So it's not significant, but the total volume, which includes mitigation has come down. Right. But again, you know, uh, talking about how we can make the recovery investments this year and moving forward, include resilience and adaptation is the challenge we've taken on uh, to ensure that we bounce back not only to that 
average of 1 billion, but go beyond. And over here, rightly, as Oyun said, uh, the role of the private sector is important and our private sector operations are now beginning to look at adaptation uh, opportunities, be it in agribusiness, be it in low cost housing, or be it also in, in a, you know, trade, uh, trade uh, financing programs as well. It's a small beginning, but you know, that kind of sensitization and uh, encouragement is taking place uh, from the very top level uh, on, on how to scale up adaptation and resilience investments uh, by the bank. And uh, it's not only through our funding, but also with partners such as uh, the Green Climate Fund and Climate Investment Funds, which have a good chunk of concessional financing to enable the countries to, to, to make those kind of investments. And I completely agree with what Salim said in his keynote you know, bulk of the climate financing is domestic financing. And if the governments have to recognize their role in channeling this financing uh, towards uh, these uh, risks uh, that the economies are going to face, uh, not only the, in the future, but which are rolling out currently as well. Thank you. Rico, can I just mention that all- Thank you so much, uh, Preeti. All countries- Yes, have, all you. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure, to, to say that all countries have national mitigation plans, but not all countries have adaptation mm. plans. So still there are many countries that have to come up with the adaptation plans. So you have, adapt you have to work on adaptation planning. Then of course it takes time for those planning processes to result in the pipeline of projects. Then they come, right? So uh, that's why of course, um, as um, Priti was saying, GCF also works with countries to write develop the adaptation plans. And we allocate at least $3 million per country on adaptation planning. And then of course, capacity building and project preparation facility. So this aspect for the adaptation is even more important than mitigation. So it just, it, it started late as uh, Salim Haq said, but then it, it takes time. And then you have this country, the, 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 uh, the specific context and the smaller scale. And then, so that's why it's a lot of, you know, much more challenging than mitigation. Okay, so let's, let's pose this question now uh, to Tiza from the Climate Policy Initiative of Indonesia. Does the country have a national adaptation plan? Indonesia has, yeah, a national adaptation plan. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, it is not a well-financed plan. So it's hmm. similar to what- Why isn't it? Why isn't it, Tiza? Why isn't it? Yeah, it is much more difficult to finance adaptation activities than mitigation activities. I think that mm -hmm. for most, for the most part, adaptation activities are not being valued enough to consider uh, to to for for especially the private sector to consider investing in. So at the moment, uh, public. Uh, policies, our public fiscal policies are focused on how uh, do we uh, spend money in uh, certain sectors that is able to, uh, at the same time, attract private financing to also invest in those sectors. So you can imagine that mitigation activities, you know, renewable energy projects, these are most likely, likelier projects to invest in. If the government is spending money on adaptation activities, such as um, uh, conserving mangroves along coastal um, lines, that does not immediately bring to mind a private sector involvement. Um, so, and, and part of the reason for that is that uh, the, the impact metrics for adaptation is also uh, relatively less understood than the impact of mitigation. So, I mean, ideally, you know, when we, when we want to see financial flows, uh, we want to align it with you know, specific impacts that we have in mind that we can measure. Uh, but at the moment, there are no universally accepted impact metrics. Uh, it's, it's crucial for full accounting of adaptation finance because the, uh, the, the incremental cost of adaptation is not reflective of the benefit of that investment. You know, for example, if mm -hmm. a $50 million drought resilient uh, wastewater investment could have vastly different resilience implications in a, in a drought vulnerable location than in a region with sufficient projected rainfall. But because impact metrics are not yet established for the global tracking of adaptation, then that the, the 22 billion annual average you know, of, of uh, adaptation finance towards adaptation that, that CPI has tracked along the way, it does not capture the resilience 
value, you know, of, uh, of that project itself. I'd just like to add one thing because um, uh, CPI recently did a report on this uh, adaptation finance in the context of COVID. Um, the, the crisis has, the COVID crisis has also impacted uh, adaptation mm -hmm. finance in the sense that yes. um, countries are becoming less, uh, they, they have less fiscal space. Um, and Correct. Uh, the, yes. Yeah. So this highlights, you know, I'll, I'll, I can speak more about this, but this highlights yeah. how so, it's more, you know, <laughs> it's more relevant than ever now, to, to attract private finance. Go on, Rico. So, so, uh, so Tisa, tell us, uh, what are the most uh, promising and creative uh, ways forward to increase adaptation uh, finance uh, in Indonesia? Um, at the moment, um, Indonesia uh, I can give you a few examples. Um, mm -hmm. the, the, the kind of adaptation activities that uh, have been taking place in Indonesia that are quite large scale have to do with cities' uh, climate resilience. And why cities? Because cities are able to invest, because metropolitan cities are able to invest in large projects, such as a giant seawall for Jakarta. You know, uh, you must have heard the term Jakarta, the fastest sinking city in the world. You know, that kind of uh, creates this mm -hmm. urgency for cities to right. invest in large scale uh, adaptation projects. Less uh, benefited are the vulnerable communities. Less benefited are the small scale uh, fisheries along the coastal um, lines in Indonesia who are impacted every single day by rising sea levels, um, but are not getting uh, the, the amount of financing needed to, um, to adapt. So the way that we envision that we could solve that problem is by um, favoring more projects with dual benefits uh, of mitigation and adaptation. So uh, that would create value in, so for example, for a, a fisheries community, if there are mangroves in that uh, fisheries community, then we could create a project where the mangrove is a mitigation project that captures uh, carbon, um, whereas the small scale fisheries uh, project is a project to ensure the resilience of that community, as well as ensure you know, biodiversity conservation, uh, not overfishing and such. So I think in the, in the future projects with dual benefits will be increasingly critical, uh, especially given the growing constraints in adaptation funding availability. Um, and uh, we need to support um, more of these dual benefits uh, uh, that addresses you know, portions of the labor market, including SMEs that are active in forest and land restoration efforts. Thank you so much, uh, Tiza, uh, for your insights. Let's now move to Abid from the Sustainable Development Policy Institute. So Abid, uh, you heard the keynote speech of Salim, you heard the statements of Oyun, uh, Priti, and Tiza. Uh, what must be done right now to scale up finance and investment in climate change adaptation? Uh, well, thank you very much. Uh, you know, there is a, a human psyche. Uh, we can uh, uh, invest uh, more after uh, damages actually has taken place. And uh, we try not to invest in uh, preventive uh, measures. And this is what we have seen in uh, COVID as well. Uh, after COVID, uh, countries like United States, while uh, they have given fiscal stimulus uh, ranging uh, to uh, almost 4 trillion uh, uh, US dollars so far, uh, we could not invest in uh, green climate uh, fund. So uh, the gray rhino uh, that is uh, very much here uh, in the sh uh, shape of uh, climate change, we are ignoring it. We are ignoring it at a global level. We are ignoring it at meso level. And unfortunately, we are ignoring it at a local level uh, too, where it matters the most. Now, if I look at uh, Pakistan, for example, so again, uh, uh, the focus uh, both uh, at uh, uh, public level as well as the private sector investment, it's on uh, mitigation. Uh, adaptation uh, often tends to get ignored because uh, uh, A, it's not uh, politically uh, quite uh, lucrative. Uh, if I'm in uh, government, uh, I'll try to uh, take a claim of uh, uh, compensating uh, uh, someone uh, who has uh, got uh, uh, some sort of uh, damage rather than uh, preventing uh, that damage to happen because then uh, no one would recognize uh, my uh, efforts. So I think that sort of uh, mindset is there. And first, we need to uh, shift from that mindset. Uh, second, when we talk of private sector investment, private uh, uh, like uh, countries like Pakistan, Bangladesh, or 
uh, many uh, other. So a private sector would not be interested uh, in uh, investing in adaptation. And uh, uh, if they are investing, uh, we don't have enough for regulation. Uh, so regulators role for private sector investment, I think uh, uh, that is uh, quite important. Uh, so that uh, they can't exploit the vulnerables, they can't ex uh, exploit uh, the weakest uh, segment of uh, society. And uh, third and most important, uh, again, uh, uh, looking at uh, Pakistan's example, I think uh, the government, uh, uh, they are doing quite a lot, uh, both on adaptation and mitigation without knowing that they are investing in adaptation. So some sort mm -hmm. of uh, reclassifying the expenditures, reclassifying uh, the policies and try to see whether they fit in adaptation, whether they fit in mitigation, they are uh, doing it just for the sake of uh, doing it or because uh, those have been part of uh, different other plans and policies. But uh, uh, I can see that uh, there are quite a lot which is uh, happening that can be classified under adaptation, but uh, uh, we are not uh, doing it in uh, that particular uh, sense. So these are uh, uh, some of the things I think uh, that needs to be done. But uh, most importantly, it's about changing the mindset and uh, giving preempting as much priority as compensation uh, uh, or damage. Uh, what, what, uh, what are some of the innovative financial instruments? Uh, how can uh, like uh, blended finance, green impact investing help uh, de-risk climate projects? Well, uh, in case of Pakistan, uh, we, we are working on uh, this uh, debt swap scheme. So, uh, uh, for example, and we, we find it quite, quite innovative uh, in a sense that uh, uh, World Bank, uh, ADB, uh, and uh, quite a few other bilateral uh, lenders uh, even after uh, COVID, uh, they have uh, offered uh, for a debt swap for a green uh, recovery. Uh, uh, but uh, again, uh, uh, the weakest link that I found is the capacity uh, within uh, uh, the relevant authorities who have to uh, then come up with the convincing and feasible proposal for this uh, debt swap arrangement. Uh, if that debt swap uh, arrangement uh, is there and we are not able to come up with the right set of uh, policies, then it becomes a really a, a pro problem. Uh, but uh, uh, one thing that has uh, uh, happened, and uh, I think uh, that, that's quite a positive, Pakistan has uh, put a cap on, uh, for example, coal energy projects. So uh, in the we are part of uh, uh, this uh, uh, China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, CPAC, which is a greater, uh, which is a component of a Belt and Road Initiative. So under uh, uh, CPEC, uh, there were a certain uh, coal-based pro power projects, uh, those were to be installed, but after uh, three uh, power plants, uh, government is uh, committed not to go for any uh, further, and uh, even some of the agreed uh, projects, uh, those uh, got halted, and now uh, the uh, funding for them uh, is being uh, uh, actually uh, you know, uh, transferred uh, to uh, some uh, green energy uh, projects. So I think uh, that is, uh, for me, uh, quite a, a positive sign. So each country within mm. their uh, own uh, arrangements, uh, they have to find innovative ways and an innovative mechanism of uh, whatever funding is available and then try to uh, spend them uh, on adaptation uh, and in a more effective and meaningful manner, uh, which uh, Salim uh, highlighted, so that they can go to mm -hmm. the most vulnerable segment of uh, the society. Abi, thank you so much uh, for your reaction to uh, Salim's uh, uh, keynote speech. Salim, if you're still online, I'd like to bring you back on board. And maybe you could uh, give uh, some of your uh, feedback and reaction to what our panelists have said, from Oyun to uh, Priti to Tiza and to Abid. And if, we, if what they have said uh, means that we are moving up to the next level in terms of adaptation uh, funding for... Uh, for a climate change. Salim. Absolutely. I, th thank you very much, Rico. And thank you to all the panelists for some excellent uh, uh, contributions. Mm. And I agree with all of them. I think, you know, we all know each other and we are all on the same page here. We are all at the mm. same bandwagon and we are promoters of adaptation uh, and we are all doing our best. I think, you know, the challenge for us collectively is how do we do a step change? Uh, incremental mm. change is not good enough. And all we are doing is incremental change. Good but not good enough, all right? And so we have to recognize that and we have to think about how do we do a lot more. I say three things. Firstly, we have to become more effective at helping each other, at networking, at uh, expressing solidarity, learning from each other. I gave the example mm -hmm. of Bangladesh. Why doesn't other countries do the same thing? We need to be sharing knowledge and experience and replicating it at scale as quickly as we can. Uh, 
across all the different platforms that we have, the funding agencies like ADB and GCF, the national entities working at the national level, we need to be getting much, much better at doing that. And then the final thing, which has already been alluded to, is capacity building. You know, countries have to understand the problem. They have to know what to do about the problem. They have to develop their national adaptation plans. These are all happening, but they're not happening fast enough. So how do we scale that up, the capacity building aspect of making countries able to both do adaptation and absorb funding to do more adaptation? Um, at the moment, it's still small scale. We need to go from small to big scale. Uh, but I think, you know, we're on the way. We just have to get better at doing everything we're doing and scale it up. How, how do we scale it up, uh, Salim? Uh, I mean, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's a very important word, scaling up. How do we do that? So uh, two things. Firstly, we ourselves have to be able to do bigger and better projects, not small scale projects anymore. We've done those. Uh -huh. We need to learn from them. We need to replicate and, and uh, uh, multiply them. But at the same time, I'll go back to my earlier argument. We cannot just rely on the climate funds that are being created and set aside for funding adaptation. Mm -hmm. We have to go to the mm -hmm. big money, you know, the trillions of dollars in private investors and in uh, the uh, public sector national budgets. You know, finance ministers of countries need to be allocating a significant amount Uh, Salim, are you still there? Um, uh, Tiza, uh, are you online? Are you online? Yes, 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 yes. Okay, uh, so what, what, what do you make of what uh, Salim just mentioned? That we have to do a step up, we have to scale up, governments have to own up, uh, governments have to do their part and not just rely on, uh, you know, green on the Green Climate Fund or on yep. the Asian Development Bank. Yep, yep, yep. I agree with that statement that we need to not focus on small scale, we need to focus on big scale, big scale to scale up, right? Um, I want to go back and add my original point that <laughs> if we also need to make sure that private finance is involved, because they're not, they've not been involved. So, mm -hmm. yes, we need to scale up, but how do we scale up, you know, uh, financing for co communities, vulnerable communities that are small scale intrinsically? Um, and the way that we do that, I think is that we need to be smart at clustering uh, small scale projects and place it in like a portfolio, if you will, so that it is a big scale project and then mm -hmm. have that be a value add to private finance, uh, private sector investors. I think that would, um, you know, if supported by the right interventions from public fiscal uh, policies that could provide the correct stimulus uh, for private finance to be involved. Uh, Oyun, uh, Priti, would you like to add to uh, what Tisa just had? Uh, what Tisa just had to say. Oyun, so let's start off with you. Yes. Well, three examples of how do we scale up. I agree completely that that's the scale and timing, right? Now, um, on readiness, capacity building, what we've done recently is we have multi-country. Uh, readiness program. It's called Africa Adaptation Program. 23 African countries. They are working together. It used to be just one country will, you know, uh, approach us and say, okay, we, we need to build our capacity, but it's going to be sort of scaling up, starting homework being done by a multiple number of countries as a group, rather than just each country, right? So uh, the, the idea is to build necessary long-lasting capacity to design, develop transformational climate adaptation projects both in crop production, but energy for agriculture sector. So with capacity readiness, scaling up. Now, uh, private sector. There are, we need to de-risk the private sector to invest in adaptation. So example being uh, Ac Acumen, uh, a private sector company investing, and then uh, funding came from also GCF, Resilient Agriculture Fund. So we need to de-risk, maybe uh, take the first loss equity so uh, encourage private sector to invest and say, okay, mm -hmm. uh, go, go forward. You may lose here or there in one or two countries. For example, the Acumen works in four, four or five countries in Africa. But then we'll take some of them yeah. if it doesn't work. And yeah. the thing be is because the private sector definitely would always want a social return for their investments. Of course. And as uh, Professor Hack was saying, 
there are already some very good projects and they're waiting to be scaled up, right? So an example recently mm -hmm. is the Great Green Wall project. And then Jeff, Global Environment Facility, but also FAO, UNCCD, they've been working on that with African countries, but for many years. So it's taken a while, probably um, almost sort of 10 years, but now it's ready to be scaled up. So we're now working with all those partners to scale it up right. and, of course, you know, going to sort of 1 billion. But then um, there was a mentioning of cities by TISA, right? Um, Pegasus, which is another private ex equity fund, they came to GCF uh, during the last board meeting and then were funding fund of funds, so subnational fund of funds. So usually the funding goes to governments, right? Or the federal. Right. But if it goes to the cities, subnational, which doesn't usually exist that often, right? So it's seven, uh, um, it's a subnational climate fund that will fund the best adaptation mitigation projects. Uh, and then we are also supporting with concessional, with the risking, with the capacity building, and. Um, but yeah. but but Oyun, I'd I'd like to I'd like to ask you a basic question here. Yeah. No? Um, uh, how can uh, vulnerable countries uh, successfully apply for green climate funding? I mean, especially for some of our participants and delegates who are just joining us right now. How can they apply for green climate funding? So our business model is working with uh, accredited entities. So we have more than 100 and half of them are international, but half of them are local also organizations as well. They can be civil society, but also local banks. But for example, even a, an example of Pegasus, which is a private equity fund, they will be working across 42 LDCs mm -hmm. and uh, seeds countries. So the, the important thing, Rico, is that we have to have country ownership and countries have to say, okay, this is our priority project. We, we don't just fund a company which comes to us or accredited entity, it has to be endorsed by the government and it has to be within yes. the line, in, in line with the adaptation project, uh, programming and planning. Thank you so much, Oyun. Uh, you, you, your thoughts, uh, Priti? Well, I'd like to take a departure over here from the rest of the panelists. I think we are <laughs> focusing too much on scale and not talking about quality. And we have to recognize mm. that good development good is also good adaptation. And uh, you know the point that Abid made, if, if your government's planning horizon is just five years, they don't care about future impacts. You know, it is about mm -hmm. this within this five year, what we can do and how we can, you know, ensure that we get voted in again. And uh, the point he was making about um, uh, compensation, et cetera. Uh, but we have to get that, uh, you know, uh, mindset in place that if we are, if our governments now on uh, are doing the planning and budgeting, it has to be risk informed, and it does not have to be only climate risk informed. You know, the pandemic has clearly shown us uh, how unprepared we were globally on any yes. kind of risk. So, so that kind of an understanding, and I don't know whose role it is. Is it the IMF or is it you know this community of practitioners who have to push that narrative for good development? And the second point, uh, yeah. I. I want to make about quality is exactly what Oyun was seeing, uh, saying earlier. You know, it's a question of how much of that financing is reaching the vulnerable and the poor um, in our countries. What is the voice they have? You know, what is the devolved governance that uh, models that we are looking at? I mean, uh, uh, in terms of money, the money will follow good projects and good planning and good prioritization. So that should be the starting point. But we should also see uh, that the quality of financing is defined by it reaching the ones who need it the most and that they have a voice in what uh, needs to be done for them to adapt, be it in the agriculture sector, be it in urban informal settlements, those are details. If we don't get that mindset in place, we can argue about only 10% going, 2% going, uh, but it's Correct. that does not make a yes, difference. Percentages. That's the argument we should be focusing on. Thank you. So, so, so Priti, how can we uh, ensure uh, and improve the quality of uh, climate adaptation finance? Well, uh, as again, Salim said, it's a question of, you know, um, uh, first starting with uh, the right kind of planning, but providing that kind of, of capacity for, for planning for the future. It is about also monitoring and evaluation, uh, you know, the budgeting and tagging that Bangladesh is doing. 
a fantastic example on how it can be uh, replicated. I know the Philippines uh, except is also doing and Indonesia is also reaching that uh, thing. But learning, learning is, you know, somehow we have these big programs, but we forget about the learning and, uh, you know, uh, scaling out that learning both within a country and across countries. So we have various fora like the ASEAN, like SACEP uh, and others, but to what extent have they really, you know, used these platforms for learning from each other? Of course, we have the V20 group of countries also, which has done a very good job of putting adaptation and vulnerability on the forefront, but how are they making this step change again uh, through these regional platforms, I think is an opportunity that we should not miss. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Priti. And uh, Abid, uh, uh, Priti has made a very good point together with Oyun and uh, Tiza uh, that it's not just all about uh, scaling up, but also the quality uh, of, uh, of the finance. Um, your thoughts? Uh, well, uh, I think there is uh, no question of either or. We have to take uh, both quality as well as scaling up uh, along. So we can't uh, mm -hmm. wait uh, for uh, these small efforts uh, to succeed. So we have to scale up. But uh, then I completely agree with Preeti that uh, those has to be uh, uh, then uh, quality should be ensured so that we can have a long term resilience. If uh, long term resilience is not there, uh, neither the uh, scaling up uh, scaling up of any uh, small project to big project uh, would do, uh, nor uh, the quality of any small project would do. So it's a long term resilience, which is, can be achieved uh, through quality and scaling up both. Uh, simultaneously. And if uh, the external financing is not available, then the governments, they have to prioritize and they have to uh, ensure uh, that they're investing from uh, the public uh, spending. And uh, it is also quite important, uh, Abid, that every cent, every cent that is uh, spent and invested is used properly and does not go to waste. Mm -hmm. that, that, that is uh, of utmost uh, importance. Uh, and I, uh, actually here I'm quite optimistic because uh, now uh, in our countries, uh, and uh, I'm sure Salim would uh, uh, vote me for it, uh, due to the rapid uh, uh, use of uh, social media, the transparency, the accountability, the citizen mm -hmm. movements, uh, I think uh, those are more empowered uh, than uh, five years ago or ten, ten years ago. Uh, but uh, there is always a room for improving uh, uh, this uh, transparency and accountability of uh, uh, the fiscal uh, uh, side of it, uh, whatever is being spent, uh, the value for money, that has to be ensured. Uh, but I'm telling you that the vulnerable and the weaker segment of society, now they would uh, no more sit quiet. Uh, of course, uh, now uh, they're in a much better position uh, to highlight if the government is uh, uh, failing them, they are right. in a much better position to highlight if the private sector is failing them. And uh, that sort of energy needs to be now uh, put uh, back in this adaptation agenda. Uh, we have two minutes before the end of this uh, plenary on finance and investment. Uh, Oyun, let me start off with you, your final word and your final thoughts on this plenary. I think uh, partnerships are very important. So APAN, for example, is a great partnership. And then we just need to, um, as uh, Professor Hack as well said, to exchange knowledge and just empower each other, support each other. And then without the partnerships, it's very difficult to go forward. Pretty, your final thoughts? Um, well, I would say, you know, look at quality along with quantity. Uh, look at long-term uh, planning horizon and risk-taking. And please use the opportunity of uh, COVID-19 recovery to build resilience for all kinds of future shocks, including climate. Thank you so much, uh, Pretty. Tisa, your final word. Yeah, I would emphasize again, I think I agree with uh, quality and quantity needing to be hand in hand and go, uh, we support together. And just on quality, uh, this harks back to my original I, statement that, you know, the impacts need to be better understood that, you know, $10 million to a water uh, um, crisis country is different has a different impact than $10 million right. to a, a developed country. So, you know, uh, we need to uh, improve uh, the, 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 our assessment of what quality really is in order mm -hmm. to prioritize uh, spending of so few funds. Thank you so much, Lisa. And Abid, 
your final thoughts. Yes, uh, one thing that I couldn't highlight here is the South-South cooperation for long-term resistance. So, of course, mm -hmm. we have been talking of uh, finances and investment in this panel, but I think there's a lot that uh, uh, the Southern countries, uh, they can learn from each other, which doesn't involve uh, finance, but uh, the better use of finance. So, it's not only about uh, acquiring finance, it's also about uh, using it uh, better, and we can learn uh, a lot from our PA right. countries who are doing well in this uh, context. Tiza Mafira, Associate Director for Climate Policy Initiative Indonesia, Oyun Sanjasuren, Director of External Affairs at Green Climate Fund, and Priti Bandarj from the Asian Development Bank, and Abid Kayum Suleri from the Sustainable Development Policy Institute. Thank you so much for joining us for this plenary session on finance and investment. And this wraps up my session for today. Wherever you are, always stay safe, stay healthy, and follow minimum health protocols. Always mask up, keep your physical distance, always wash your hands and sanitize. I'm Rico Hizon, your host and moderator. Thank you so much for joining us. Bye for now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you for attending today's session as part of the seventh Asia Pacific Climate Change Adaptation Forum. Please join us for the technical sessions beginning in 30 minutes. You can find the link to join these sessions by returning to the sessions tab on the APAN Forum conference community on through below. Within the community, you can also explore the exhibitions as well as chat or set up meetings with other conference attendees. Join the conversation on social media using the hashtag APAN2020. And thank you again for your participation and see you in the upcoming sessions. Have a wonderful day, everyone.